Book Two, Sections Seven through Eight of King Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Cole by Upton Sinclair. Book Two: The Serfs of King Cole. Section Seven. Hal did not look back, but turned in to the company store. North Valley Trading Company read the sign over the door. Within was a Serbian woman pointing out what she wanted to buy, and two little Lithuanian girls watching the weighing of a pound of sugar. Hal strolled up to the person who was doing the weighing, a middle-aged man with a yellow mustache stained with tobacco juice. "'Morning, Judge.' "'Huh!' was the reply from Silas Adams, Justice of the Peace in the town of North Valley. "'Judge,' said Hal, "'what do you think about the election?' "'I don't think about it,' said the other. "'Busy way in sugar. "'Anybody round here going to vote for MacDougall?' "'They better not tell me if they are.' "'What?' smiled Hal. "'In this free American Republic?' "'In this part of the free American Republic a man is free to dig coal, "'but not to vote for a skunk like MacDougall.' "'Then, having tied up the sugar, the J.P. whittled off a fresh chew from his plug, and turned to Hal. "'What'll you have?' Hal purchased half a pound of dried peaches, so that he might have an excuse to loiter, and be able to keep time with the jaws of the judge. While the order was being filled, he seated himself upon the counter. "'You know,' said he, "'I used to work in a grocery.' "'That so? Where at?' "'Peterson and Company, in American City.' Hal had told this so often that he had begun to believe it. "'Pay pretty good up there?' "'Yes, pretty fair.' Then, realizing that he had no idea what would constitute good pay in a grocery, Hal added quickly, "'Got a bad wrist here.' "'That so?' said the other. He did not show much sociability, but Hal persisted, refusing to believe that anyone in a country store would miss an opening to discuss politics even with a miner's helper. "'Tell me,' said he, "'just what is the matter with MacDougall?' "'The matter with him,' said the judge, "'is that the company's against him.' He looked hard at the young miner. "'You meddlin' in politics?' he growled. But the young miner's gay brown eyes showed only appreciation of the earlier response. So the J.P. was tempted into specifying the would-be congressman's vices. Thus conversation started, and pretty soon the others in the store joined in. Bob Johnson, bookkeeper and postmaster, and Jake Pedrovich, the Galician Jew who was a member of the local school board, and knew the words for staple groceries in fifteen languages. Hal listened to an exposition of the crimes of the political opposition in Pedro County. Their candidate, MacDougall, had come to the state as a tin-horn gambler, yet now he was going around making speeches in churches and talking about the moral sentiment of the community. "'And him with a district chairman keeping three families in Pedro,' declared Cy Adams. "'Well,' ventured Hal, "'if what I hear is true, the Republican chairman isn't a plaster saint. They say he was drunk at the convention.' "'Maybe so,' said the J.P., but we ain't playin' for the prohibition vote, and we ain't playin' for the labor vote, trying to stir up the riffraff in these coal camps, promisin' em high wages and short hours. Don't he know he can't get it for em? But he figures he'll go off to Washington and leave us here to deal with the mess he's stirred up. Don't you fret, put in Bob Johnson. He ain't goin' to know Washington. The other two agreed, and Hal ventured again. He says you stuff the ballot boxes. What do you suppose his crowd is doing in the cities? We got to meet him some way, ain't we? Oh, I see, said Hal, naively. You stuff them worse. Sometimes we stuff the boxes, and sometimes we stuff the voters. There was an appreciative titter from the others, and the J.P. was moved to reminiscence. Two years ago I was election clerk over to Sheridan, and we found we'd let him get ahead of us. They had carried the whole state. "'By God,' said Alf, "'Raymond, we'll show em a trick from the coal counties. 
and there won't be no recount business either. So we held back our returns till the rest had come in, and when we seen how many votes we needed, we wrote them down, and that settled it. That seems a simple method, remarked Hal. They'll have to get up early to beat Alf. You betcha, said Cy, with the complacency of one of the gang. They call this county the Empire of Raymond. It must be a cinch, said Hal, being the sheriff and having the naming of so many deputies as they need in these coal camps. Yes, agreed the other, and there's his wholesale liquor business, too. If you want a license in Pedro County, you not only vote for Alf, but you pay your bills on time. Must be a fortune in that, remarked Hal, and the judge, the postmaster, and the school commissioner appeared like children listening to a story of a feast. You bet you. I suppose it takes money to run politics in this county, Hal added. Well, Alf don't put none of it up, you can bet. That's the company's job this from the judge, and the school commissioner added, "'De coin in these camps is beer.' "'Oh, I see,' laughed Hal. "'The companies buy Alf's beer and use it to get him votes.' "'Sure thing,' said the postmaster. At this moment he happened to reach into his pocket for a cigar, and Hal observed a silver shield on the breast of his waistcoat. "'That a deputy's badge?' he inquired and then turned to examine the school commissioner's costume. "'Where's yours?' "'I get mine when election comes,' said Jake, with a grin. "'And yours, Judge?' "'I'm a justice of the peace, young feller,' said Silas, with dignity. Leaning round and observing a bulge on the right hip of the school commissioner, Hal put out his hand towards it. Instinctively the other moved his hand to the spot. Hal turned to the postmaster. "'Yours?' he asked. "'Mine's under the counter,' grinned Bob. "'And yours, Judge?' "'Mine's in a desk,' said the Judge. Hal drew a breath. "'Gee,' said he, "'it's like a steel trap.' He managed to keep the laugh on his face, but within he was conscious of other feelings than those of amusement. He was losing that first fine careless rapture with which he had set out to run with the hare and the hounds in North Valley. End of Section 7 Section 8 Two days after this beginning of Howe's political career, it was arranged that the workers who were to make a demand for a check weighman should meet in the home of Mrs. David. When Mike Sicoria came up from the pit that day, Hal took him aside and told him of the gathering. A look of delight came upon the old Slovak's face as he listened. He grabbed his buddy by the shoulders, crying, "'You mean it?' "'Sure meant it,' said Hal. "'You want to be on the committee to go and see the boss?' "'Pluha bierna!' cried Mike, which is something dreadful in his own language. "'By Judas, I pack up my old box again!' Hal felt a guilty pang. Should he let this old man into the thing? "'You think you'll have to move out of camp?' he asked. "'Move out of state this time. Move back to old country, maybe.' And Hal realized that he could not stop him now, even if he wanted to. The old fellow was so much excited that he hardly ate any supper, and his buddy was afraid to leave him alone, for fear he might blurt out the news. It had been agreed that those who attended the meeting should come one by one and by different routes. Hal was one of the first to arrive, and he saw that the shades of the house had been drawn, and the lamps turned low. He entered by the back door where Big Jack David stood on guard. Big Jack, who had been a member of the South Wales Federation at home, made sure of Hal's identity, and then passed him in without a word. Inside was Mike, the first on hand. Mrs. David, a little black-eyed woman with a never-ceasing tongue, was bustling about, putting things in order. She was so nervous that she could not sit still. This couple had come from their birthplace only a year or so ago, and had brought all their wedding presents to their new home, 
pictures and bric-a-brac and linen. It was the prettiest home Hal had so far been in, and Mrs. David was risking it deliberately, because of her indignation that her husband had had to forswear his union in order to get work in America. The young Italian Rovetta came, then old John Edstrom. There being not chairs enough in the house, Mrs. David had set some boxes against the wall, covering them with cloth, and Hal noticed that each person took one of these boxes, leaving the chairs for the later comers. Each one, as he came in, would nod to the others, and then silence would fall again. When Mary Burke entered, Hal divined from her aspect and manner that she had sunk back into her old mood of pessimism. He felt a momentary resentment. He was so thrilled with this adventure, he wanted everybody else to be thrilled, especially Mary. Like every one who has not suffered much, he was repelled by a condition of perpetual suffering in another. Of course, Mary had good reasons for her black moods, but she herself considered it necessary to apologize for what she called her complainin'. She knew that he wanted her to help encourage the others, but here she was, putting herself in a corner, and watching this wonderful proceeding as if she had said, I'm an ant, and I stay in line, but I'll not pretend I have any hope in it. Rosa and Jerry had insisted on coming, in spite of Hal's offer to spare them. After them came the Bulgarian Resmok, then the Polacks, Klowoski and Zamirowski. Hal found these difficult names to remember, but the Polacks were not at all sensitive about this. They would grin good-naturedly while he practiced, nor would they mind if he gave it up and called them Tony and Pete. They were humble men, accustomed all their lives to being driven about. Hal looked from one to another of their bowed forms and toil-worn faces, appearing more than ever somber and mournful in the dim light. He wondered if the cruel persecution which had driven them to protest would suffice to hold him in line. Once a newcomer, having misunderstood the orders, came to the front door and knocked, and Hal noted that everyone started, and some rose to their feet in alarm. Again he recognized the atmosphere of novels of Russian revolutionary life. He had to remind himself that these men and women, gathered here like criminals, were merely planning to ask for a right guaranteed them by the law. The last to come was an Austrian miner named Huzar, with whom Olson had gotten into touch. Then, it being time to begin, everybody looked uneasily at everybody else. Few of them had conspired before, and they did not know quite how to set about it. Olson, the one who would naturally have been their leader, had deliberately stayed away. They must run this Czech Wayman affair for themselves. "'Somebody talk,' said Mrs. David at last. And then, as the silence continued, she turned to Hal. "'You're going to be the Czech Wayman. You talk.' "'I'm the youngest man here,' said Hal, with a smile. "'Some older fellow talk.' But nobody else smiled. "'Go on!' exclaimed old Mike. And so at last Hal stood up. It was something he was to experience many times in the future. Because he was an American, and educated, he was forced into a position of leadership. "'As I understand it, you people want a Czech Wayman. Now, they tell me the pay for a check weighman should be three dollars a day, but we've got only seven miners among us, and that's not enough. I will offer to take the job for twenty-five cents a day from each man, which will make a dollar seventy-five, less than what I'm getting now as a buddy. If we get thirty men to come in, then I'll take ten cents a day from each and make the full three dollars. Does that seem fair?" Sure, said Mike, and the others added their assent by word or nod. All right, now there's nobody that works in this mine but knows the men don't get their weight. It would cost the company several hundred dollars a day to give us our weight, and nobody should be so foolish as to imagine they'll do it without a struggle. We've got to make up our minds to stand together. 
"'Sure, stand together!' cried Mike. "'No get check wayman!' exclaimed Jerry, pessimistically. "'Not unless we try, Jerry,' said Hal. And Mike thumped his knee. "'Sure, try, and get him, too!' "'Right!' cried Big Jack. But his little wife was not satisfied with the response of the others. She gave Hal his first lesson in the drilling of these polyglot masses. "'Talk to them. Make them understand you.' And she pointed them out one by one with her finger. "'You! You! Resma! Here! And you, Klawoski! And you, Zam— You other Polish fellow! Want check Wayman! Want to get all weight! Get all our money! Understand?' "'Yes, yes!' Get committee. Go see super. Want check wayman. Understand? Got to have check wayman. No back down. No scare. No, no scare. Klawoski, who understood some English, explained rapidly to Zamirowski, and Zamirowski, whose head was still plastered where Jeff Cotton's revolver had hit it, nodded eagerly in assent. In spite of his bruises, he would stand by the others and face the boss. This suggested another question. Who's going to do the talking to the boss? You do that, said Mrs. David to Hal. But I'm the one that's to be paid. It's not for me to talk. No one else can do it right, declared the woman. Sure, got to be American feller, said Mike. But Hal insisted, if he did the talking, it would look as if the check wayman had been the source of the movement, and was engaged in making a good-paying job for himself. There was discussion back and forth, until finally John Edstrom spoke up. Put me on the committee. You, said Hal, but you'll be thrown out, and what will your wife do? I think my wife is going to die tonight, said Edstrom simply. He sat with his lips set tightly, looking straight before him. After a pause he went on, "'If it isn't to-night, it will be to-morrow,' the doctor says, and after that nothing will matter. I shall have to go down to Pedro to bury her, and if I have to stay it will make little difference to me, so I might as well do what I can for the rest of you. I've been a miner all my life, and Mr. Cartwright knows it that might have some weight with him. Let Joe Smith and Sicoria and myself be the ones to go and see him, and the rest of you wait, and don't give up your jobs unless you have to. End of section 8